Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us in the last talk from the Physio webinar. This event has been organized by graduate students from the Institute of Biosciences of the University of Sao Paulo. This is our team. We organized four very interesting talks with speakers from different countries talking about different physiology themes and they intersection with other areas. Please follow us to get more information about future physio webinars. Today, we are glad to welcome Dr. Shelley Adamo, a zoologist by University of Toronto and a PhD by McGill University from Canada. Currently, she is a full professor at Dalhousie University. Also, she is an internationally recognized expert in the field of equimmunology and comparative psychoneuroimmunology. Her work explores the interactions between behavior and physiology using invertebrate model systems. Dr. Shelley Adamo, thank you very much for your presence here today. After your talk, we will have 30 minutes to take questions from the audience. Everyone can ask questions through the YouTube chat. They can also be in Portuguese if you like. And our team will select and send them to me. This event will be recorded and will be available through YouTube after the transmission. With no more details, I will give to the word to you now. Thank you. Um, should I start? I'm sorry. <laughs> After we had this discussion about what I'm supposed to do, um, I guess I'll just jump into it. Hi, my name is um, Shelly Adamo. Thank you so much for that kind invitation and, and uh, introduction. And thank you for inviting me to your webinar series. I'm quite honored to get a chance to speak. Um, so hopefully everyone can see my slides. So what I want to talk about today is, is actually a very large topic looking at how organisms are really interconnected physiological networks. So the title is, it's not pathology, it's a plan. Physiological networks allow organisms to reallocate resources during stress. So that's a really big topic. And to try to um, look at it in detail, we're going to focus on the immune system. Uh, the immune system is actually key, is key to survival, as people know. Infection is a constant threat. We live in a world filled with pathogens and pathogens are an important force of natural selection. What this means is that animals are selected to defend themselves, to put resources into their immune system. It's important, you need one. And you need this defense if you're going to survive. So, so it's a good key system to look at. So we're gonna use this as our system to understand how physiological networks can come together and explain some, some paradoxical connections. So again, the key issue I wanna to try to hammer home is the fact that organisms are interconnected networks and to try not to think of them as isolated silos. You have a cardiac system and an immune system and a digestive system. In truth, they all coexist and they all communicate together. And immune systems are no exception. So they do not exist in isolation in the body. Now, probably most of you are saying, well, of course, we know that's true. But that's actually kind of a novel idea. 60 years ago, if I were to say that statement, people would have been surprised because the immune system itself is a very complicated system with its own regulators. So immune systems re release chemicals, signaling molecules called cytokines, and they're very good at regulating themselves. So I have my little pointer here. Immune cells have receptors for their own signaling molecules. They release them and they seem to be able to do quite well on their own. The nervous system, which is the master coordinator for many years was not actually thought to do much coordinating to the immune system. It seemed to do such a great job on its own. But about 40 years ago, it became quite clear that the two systems were not independent. 
the immune system, those cytokines, those chemical signaling molecules of the immune system also talk to the nervous system. So the immune system's talking to the nervous system and the nervous system's talking to the immune system because immune cells, cells like white, various types of white blood cells in mammals have receptors for neuromodulators and hormones. So the immune system talks to the nervous system and the nervous system talks to the immune system. So it's as if they have this coordinated system. And now we know it's, they're even more closely tied. We can't really even think of them as separate systems because the immune system will not behave normally without the nervous system. So the nervous system's modulators are key for making sure your immune system does what it's supposed to do. And it turns out that the nervous system we know has immune cells embedded in it. Those are microglia cells inside the brain. And insects have those too, by the way, invertebrates have them, vertebrates have them. And it, what we know in vertebrates where it's been well studied is that those immune cells of the brain actually contribute to the brain's functioning. It's important for those neural circuits to do what they need to do. So in other words, these two systems are intimately connected and they need each other to function properly. And you might wonder why, why would they be so interconnected? And it's worse than that, if you like simple systems, that is, because it's not just the immune system and the nervous system that are connected, but we're now finding that the immune system is connected to muscle, connected to the digestive system, connected to most physiological systems in the body. So they're all playing a role in the immune system's function. So why, why would we have these interconnections? What's going on? And what I'm hoping to show you today, I'm gonna to take some examples, concrete examples, to show you that their connections, one of the reasons they're there is that they are adaptive and they maximize function for different contexts. Because again, think of the body as this interconnected network as opposed to these individual systems. And the animal is selected to survive and thrive under different kinds of challenges. And that means all of its systems are going to work together to make sure the animal can face its challenges in the best possible way. So that's how I view organisms. And so what I started getting interested in was if you have that perspective, how does that change the way you see things like for example, stress-induced immunosuppression, which is often or has in the past been considered just a pathological outcome of um, stress response activation. So when animals are faced with life-threatening fight or flight conditions, and they need to maximize physical output, the grizzly bear is coming at you. I can only imagine what you have in Brazil, but I'm sure you have many predators that you would have to run from. But in Canada, the grizzly bear would be a good one. So you have to get away from this. You have to run and you have to have maximal physiological output. That induces what's called a window of vulnerability in you. What this means is that after you've run a marathon, after you've had many bouts with the grizzly bear, you are going to have a time where you are going to be more susceptible to infection. Your body will have less ability to defend yourself. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure how your university works with um, terms, but our university is just coming into finals for the fall semester. And we know that students who are under stress during exam period actually have an increased risk of getting infections, getting flus and colds, and heaven forbid, not COVID, I hope. But anyway, um, it's, it's a time of vulnerability. And it's not just humans. People have found this in humans, of course, in rodents, in mollusks, and in insects. In other words, this is a very common problem across many animals. So if it's just, if it's just a pathology, it's just, you know, one of those, oh, well, bad things happen, you would think there would be some selection against this, that there would be some workaround, there would be some solution. Unless, of course, it's actually the solution, unless, of course, you need to do this to maximize function. So let's talk about that. To understand this, we're going to have to drill down 
into the details of a particular system. And that system is going to be the one I work on. What a surprise which is the caterpillar Manduca sexta. So this is a temperate zone caterpillar. And of course it has to face many pathogen challenges, bacteria, viruses, fungi. It also has to um, uh, face a large number of predators. So insects tend to be close to the bottom of the food chain and lots of things eat them. So high predator stress conditions are a normal feature of their life. So some of you may not be familiar with insect stress responses. And because we're gonna to need to look at the physiological details, I need to kind of walk you through what insects do when they're under fight or flight stress. So here are two crickets fighting. So you can have crickets fighting, crickets flying, caterpillars under predator stress. What do insects do when they're faced with a fight or flight challenge? They have some of the same type of physiological responses that we have, that mammals have. And so, um, as a matter of fact, they have somewhat of an analogous stress response system. So let me walk you through what mammals do, because we're more, you're probably more familiar with that. So if you, if you see the grizzly bear in the distance, your brain is going to appreciate that bad things are going to happen unless you get out of the way. That is going to activate very rapidly your first response, which is the sympathetic nervous system. And the sympathetic nervous system is going to do a whole array of things for you, including release a compound called norepinephrine. And norepinephrine is going to help you kickstart a number of things like increase blood pressure and get your body ready. Then in a parallel, slightly slower system, your brain is also going to tell your hypothalamus pituitary gland nexus to release compounds so that your adrenal gland will release glucocorticoids. And those glucocorticoids are going to get your um, energy compounds liberated so your muscles can be maximally active as you feel that grizzly bear breathing down your neck. Insects have an, an analogous systems. So when here's our poor scared cricket, Here's the predator. When the cricket brain recognizes that predation could happen, there's a predator in the area, it activates a system similar to the sympathetic nerve or analogous to the sympathetic nervous system in mammals and releases a stress neurohormone called octopamine, which is the chemical cousin of norepinephrine. And I'll show you that in a minute. And that happens very quickly. So that's the fast path. The slightly slower path goes through the endocrine gland, the corpora cardiaca, the CC here, for the release of adipokinetic hormone, which is like glucocorticoids. It helps activate and liberate energy resources so that the insect can maximally have its physical response. It's interesting how analogous these two systems are in vertebrates and insects. So here's the vertebrate um, uh, sympathetic nervous system uh, compound, norepinephrine. Here's the stress neurohormone in um, insects, octopamine. Notice that these chemicals are very similar. They only vary by this hydroxyl group where there's an extra one for norepinephrine. And it turns out they come from the same ancestral molecule. So we believe somewhere in evolutionary time there was a division, but they came from the same ancestral stress response. So these are very ancient responses. So that's, that's like a 400 million year conservation. So let me just show you some data from our caterpillars, just so you can see that that it's similar to what you might expect you would see in a mammal. So if you give a caterpillar, here's my friend, the caterpillar, and you give them a mock predator stress. So we have a mock predator stress. We, we sort of, whoops, sorry. We just sort of squeeze a leg and that we make them do their anti-predator behavior. And if you do that, you get an increase in the level of octopamine in their chemolymph. So there you can measure the increase in their stress neurohormone, it goes up as you would predict. And if you give them a chronic stress, like you, you keep exposing them to a predator, you get a chronically elevated level of octopamine. So octopamine will chronically elevate if it looks like it's a high predation environment. So predators seem to be constantly getting at them. 
So what does the stress hormone do for insects? What does octopamine do to help them respond to predators? Well, what octopamine does a whole series of things, just like your stress hormones do a whole array of things for you. So for the insect, octopamine increases heart rate it, uh, for the insect. It also works with the fat body, which is a storage organ, energy storage organ, and an immune organ, it does two things. And it induces the octopamine, induces the fat body to release energy storage molecules like lipids and carbohydrates, sugars. So it makes the fat body release those into the circulation. It also enhances muscle performance. So the muscle has a little more oomph to it. And it also increases sensitivity of some sensory neurons. So it increases sensory organ sensitivity. And you can see how all of those things would increase the ability of an insect to respond to a predator. But does it work? Does it, does it really do anything for the insect? How does it, does it, does it really help them? And the answer is yes. I like in my lab to really show the functional significance. So I'm gonna show you some slides with that. In this case, this was a study we did with crickets as opposed to caterpillars. And we placed crickets in with a bearded dragon. That was our predator. And we would have three different crickets in the container with them. They were under these cups. And then at a certain time, we would raise the cup simultaneously and we would see which cricket got eaten. So the crickets would run. There was a little shelter they could hide in. And so the question was, who got eaten first? And if we injected crickets with octopamine, the stress hormone, prior to this trial, the ones that were injected with octopamine were less likely to be eaten. So they were more likely to evade the predator. They were more successful. And you could get the same effect by exposing crickets to a predator just prior to their predator trial. So if you scared them with a predator or just shot them up with octopamine, they had an increased survival level. They were more likely to evade the predator than say if you just injected them with saline, the vehicle for the drug. So stress response is the bottom line stress responses work. They do enhance anti-predator behavior. There's a good reason we have them. Well, if that's true, why don't we have them on all the time? Maybe hypervigilance. Wouldn't it be good to be always hypervigilant if you're living, especially if you're an insect, and you're living with lots of predators around and you're, you know, you're kind of a little critter, wouldn't it be better to always be prepared for predators? Because let's face it, you're going to have them all the time. So why not always be prepared? I bet all, I bet most of you in the audience know the answer. Well, why not? Well, because it's expensive. You can't do it all the time because it's going to cost you. And one of the ways, one of the easiest ways we showed the cost in the caterpillars is for, they gain weight more slowly. So they don't for the same amount of food. So they're not decreasing their food consumption, but their weight gain is down. And that's because we believe that their metabolic rates are elevated and they're just chewing through their food faster. So they're using up those resources and they can't store them so they can't gain weight. And remember, this is the larval form of the moth, which is the adult. And its job as a larval of a larvae is to bulk up because as an adult, the, oops, sorry, as an adult, the moths hardly eat, hardly eat at all. And they are relying on the lipid reserves that the larvae lay down to lay eggs. So it's very important. They got to get a lot of weight. And so their weight gain is less and their development time is longer. Not a surprise. So it's taking longer for them to get through the larval stage. That's another cost because this stage is where they have the most risk of being preyed upon. So the, especially once they get towards the end of their larval stage, they are very susceptible to a lot of predators and they usually try to get through this phase fast. They eat 24 hours a day. They try to bulk up as quickly as they can. So this costs them in a couple of different ways. Another way it costs them is it reduces their resistance to disease. So this is actually work we did with crickets just because we have the clearest data for them. If crickets fight or crickets fly, they have some sort of predator stress, they are more susceptible to a bacterial infection. In this study, 
we injected them with heat killed bacteria or live, sorry, we injected them with live bacteria and we just saw the same dose and we just saw who lived and who died. And those animals that had to, that fought before they were exposed to bacteria or flew before they, they um, were exposed to bacteria or had a predator stress before they got exposed to the bacteria, it didn't matter what we did, they were less likely to survive. So they were more likely to die of the bacterial infection if they had a stressor first. So that's that window of vulnerability that we talked about that you can find in a whole array of animals. So what is it about the, a stress response that, that leads to this decrease in disease resistance? What, what is it? Um, I'm, we know a little bit about it, but one of the main players, sadly, is your stress hormone. So in the case of insects and mammals, actually, the stress, the same hormone that is giving you all those great advantages to evade the predator is somehow correlated with a loss in immune capacity. So you're less able. So here we've, we've looked at, we give them the, the uh, bacterial challenge. And if we give them a high dose of octopamine, a pharmacologically high dose, sort of abnormally high, or even if we give them a more physiological dose, sort of close to what they get with a real stress response, either way, we see a decrease in their ability to overcome a bacterial infection. They're more likely to die. So somehow there's a correlation between high octopamine levels and an inability to get rid of those bacteria. So this is where sometimes you would think about pathology, right? Because you're thinking to yourself, hmm, I'm doing fight or flight. I've got a predator after me. What are the risks that I'm gonna get wounded? Probably there's some risk. It's probably reasonably high. And if I'm wounded and I've got now a break in my physical barrier, and one of the most important protections against infection is your physical barrier. So your skin or your exoskeleton, when that gets breached, that's when you have a big risk of infection. So it's really important to make sure you maintain that physical integrity. But during predator exposure, odds are you might get, you know, a break in your exoskeleton. And now you're going to have an increased risk of infection. And we tested that exactly. And it turns out, yes, if you expose animals to predator stress, and then we drop the known amount of bacteria into a prescribed wound of a certain size in their exoskeleton, they had an increased risk of dying of that infection. So basically during predator stress, you have a reduction in your ability to fight off wound infections, and you're more likely to get wounded during an interaction with a predator. So this looks really maladaptive, and this is why many people would look at this and say, well, this is probably a pathology, and people have said. But it, as a biologist, I never, this never sat well with me. Why would a high predation environment be immunosuppressive? This seems like the time where you absolutely need a vigorous immune response. So you could have two possibilities. You know, you could argue that it's just pathological dysregulation due to chronic stress. You're living in a high predation environment, you're hypervigilant, and one of the costs of that is now your immune system is toast. Why is it toast? Who knows? But I don't believe this because it's driven by intricate intracellular signaling mechanisms. There's, and I'm not going to talk about the intracellular level right now. I'm going to stay on the organismal level, but we have done work and, and it's clear that these are evolved pathways. Let's just say that. And also because the phenomenon exists across phyla, it suggests it's important that there's some reason you need to do this. Asking those sorts of questions is the hallmark of what's called ecoimmunology. So it's around, this field has been around for about 20 years now. And it's, the, it's looking at immune systems from an evolutionary perspective. So I wanna kind of take you on a journey. We're gonna think about physiological networks Think about the immune system as part of those networks, and we're going to take an eco-immunological perspective, which means an evolutionary perspective. What does that mean? That means we're gonna ask a question. What we're gonna ask is, 
how could this immunosuppression be beneficial? Why is that window of vulnerability there? Why is it there? And could it have anything to do with the fact the immune system is interconnected with many other systems? Is there a relationship between these two things? One way you could look at this, the standard way of looking at this as an eco-immunologist, and probably all of you sitting there are thinking this too, is the idea of trade-offs. Why would you have immunosuppression? Well, animals are on fixed energy budgets. And if you increase the amount of resources you're dedicating to anti-predator behavior, there has to be a reduction in others. So here's the immune system. These are supposed to be immune cells. If we increase the amount of resources we give to anti-predator behavior, that means there's less for something else. And that something else could be the immune system. So the idea is, is when here you are, you're facing the Tyrannosaurus Rex, you're just, you've decided the body has been selected to put investment into fight or flight, and you'll worry about diseases later. Let's not worry about disease right now. That would be one explanation. But let me show you some data for my caterpillars, which makes this seem maybe not a full answer. So I'm sure there are trade-offs going on, but let me take you through this. So these are various immune traits in the caterpillar. And we're gonna talk about insect immune systems in more detail in, in a moment. Right now, it doesn't matter what these things are. Just let's just say they're all components of the immune system. During the pathogen attack, not surprisingly, these different immune components become active and they increase in effectiveness. So when a bacterium comes into a, an insect or bacteria infection, bacterial infection occurs, the insect increases all of these different immune responses. Well, that's fine. That's just no surprise because that's what you would do. That's what your body does. But what does immune, what happens with a predator stress? What does predator stress do to these immune responses? If it was a simple trade-off, you would expect that these would all be decreased because resources are being shifted away from the immune system and they're being put into anti-predator behavior. But that's not what happens. Look at this pattern. This pattern is weird. Okay, so something, uh, uh, something decreases, but some things are increasing. So that doesn't really fit the idea of a simple trade-off. Why are things increasing, but you're still getting a decrease in disease resistance and the pattern is complicated? How can we explain this? What my argument is going to be, or what I'm gonna to try to show you, is that if you think about physiological systems as being interconnected and thinking of them as being really an integrated defense system for the animal and that they share resources, we can explain why we have this complex immune response to predator stress. So let's walk through it and see if we can, we can at least I'll show you some examples that we've worked out. To do that, unfortunately, we're going to have to take a bit of a dive again into insect physiology, and I'm gonna walk you through insect immune systems. They're simpler than vertebrate immune systems, so that's good, but they, they're different, so let me just explain. So insect immune systems have different components. For example, they have cell-mediated immunity, and that's run by their blood cells. Just like we have white blood cells, they have blood cells called hemocytes. And those blood cells do the same kind of thing that your macrophages do. So they, they can engulf and destroy bacteria with phagocytosis. They can also encapsulate foreign bodies and wall them off and suffocate them. So that gets rid of another, those pathogens. So, so hemocytes have a couple of different ways they can destroy invaders. Then we have the humoral arm of the immune system. And those are all the enzymes and other chemical defenses that the insect has against invaders. So we have enzymes like phenyloxidase that can produce reactive molecules that destroy pathogens. We have proteins like lysozymes that can get active and cause chemical um, damage and antimicrobial peptides that, that do some, some similar types of things. So again, chemical attack on pathogens. So let me just walk through what happens when an insect gets sick. So when, when a pathogen breaches the exoskeleton of an insect, 
it interacts with pathogen recognition molecules. These are protein molecules in the blood that recognize molecular motifs that say that there's a bacterium or a virus or a fungus present. So they're not specific for a particular pathogen, but for a class of pathogens. And once they get active, they activate insect cytokines, those chemical signaling molecules. The cytokines activate the blood cells and kick them into act and kick them, kickstart them to get them to attack the pathogens, and also tell the fat body to start making lysozyme and antimicrobial peptides so we can have a chemical attack on the pathogens. And these two arms work together to destroy the pathogen. Okay, so what happens during predator stress? How does predator stress negatively impact the immune system? Well, it turns out it's subtle. Let's review what happens with predator stress. Remember, we have the release of octopamine and both octopamine and that other stress, home, stress hormone, adipokinetic hormone, both tell the fat body to release energy storage molecules, including lipid. And that's the one we wanna focus on right now. So when the predator, predator stress happens, the insect responds by liberating quite a bit of lipid. So it's prepared to do some running or flying or fighting or whatever it has to do to get away from the predator. Okay, why is that a problem? The problem is not even just energy, but beyond energy, many of the molecules in our body and the body of insects are what we call molecular moonlighters. That means they have multiple functions. They do more than one thing. The problem is they can't do more than one thing at a time. So if a molecule is doing function A, it can't do function B. And usually in most bodies, you only have enough for one function or another and things get moved around and that has repercussions for different physiological systems. So let me show how this works with the immune system. So it turns out that lipid, as you know, is not water soluble. How is lipid going to get to where it needs to go, like to the muscle or some of the other organs that we need for anti-predator behavior? It's going to be carried by a lipoprotein, by a protein whose job it is to ferry fat around. There is one protein called apolipoforin-3, and it has two jobs that it can do. It can ferry fat, or it can act as an immune surveillance molecule where it looks for lipopolysaccharides, which are a marker for bacterial infection. It can do one of two, but it can't do both. So what happens with predator stress? You get this release of lipid and Usually lipid is carried by something called high density lipoforin, but it gets overwhelmed if there's too much lipid, which happens during predator stress. So high density lipoforin calls on apolipoforin-3 to join it to form low density lipoforin, which has a much larger fat carrying capacity. So now this is great. We can ferry lots of fat around. But now apolipoforin-3 is no longer available to act as an immune surveillance molecule. Usually when it's an immune surveillance molecule, when it senses a bacterial component, it goes through a conformational change and activates the immune response. So that's, that's what it does most, much of the time, unless you're having a lot of lipid that you need to shift. In essence, the stress hormones, octopamine and adipokinetic hormone, are effectively shifting this molecule from immune surveillance, from being part of the immune system to being part of anti-predator behavior by moving it towards lipid transport. So the stress hormone is shifting the function of apolipoforin-3. This means we now have a loss in immune surveillance the immune system now effectively is somewhat blind. It's lost one of its major immune surveillance molecules. So if you think about it, here's pretend the car is the immune system. Play go car, we got a Lego car, pretend that's the immune system. The anti-predator system says, look, I need that wheel. I need that wheel right now or we're gonna die. So the Lego car, which is the immune system, 
gives its wheel up to the anti-predator system. And now it's only got three wheels. Here's our immune system, which is a three wheel truck. That three wheel car is not gonna move very well. So is that just gonna sit there and not move? No, because physiological systems are used to having to deal with multiple stressors at the same time. As a rule, stresses do not come single, sing, singly to animals, but they have to deal with lots of things at once. So what happens is the immune system rebuilds itself. It says, okay, it re-sculpts itself. So now it's a truck with three wheels. So now it can at least move a little bit. How does it do that? How does the insect do that as opposed to a Lego car? Here's what it does. It turns out work I did with uh, some Chinese colleagues, we found that hemocyte cells, those immune blood cells have receptors for octopamine. So the stress hormone that's activating all of those anti-predator behaviors at the same time is activating hemocytes to increase their effectiveness. So it kickstarts those hemocytes and so they have additional motility, they move more, and they're better at phagocytosis. They upregulate. So what's really happening, let's just take us through it. Octopamine gets released. We have some fighting crickets or caterpillars trying to get away from their predator. You get a release in octopamine, which induces an increase of lipid. So we have liberation of lipid which forces apolipoforin-3 to leave the immune pool. It's no longer part of the immune network and it's joining the lipid transport system, yay. So now it's ferrying lots of lipid to muscle and all the tissues that need it. At the same time, but sadly, that means we have less immune surveillance. At the same time, octopamine is reducing the negative impact by upregulating hemocyte function same time. And we get, we still get ultimately a decline in disease resistance, but not as bad as it would have been. So we get a little bit back. So I'm arguing that's why we're getting this increase in phagocytosis. So it seems strange. Why is predator stress increasing phagocytosis? Because octopamine, the stress hormone, that stress response is also causing the immune system to reconfigure itself. It works differently now. And part of that difference is that phagocytosis is upregulated compared to baseline when there's no predators around. Now that doesn't mean it's perfect. I mean, look at this car. Is this car as good as this car? All this car can do is go in circles after all. Look at how the wheel is. So it's not perfect. So you don't go back to baseline but it helps you do the best you can under the circumstances. So natural selection is not for perfection. Evolution doesn't work that way. You're not trying to make perfect organisms. We're just trying to get the best possible organisms given the situation. So that's what natural selection will, will prefer or will select for. And organisms will be selected to rewire themselves to be able to give the best response even when you have multiple challenges. So why are we seeing this complex response in predator stress? Why is it at all just negative? Because there's reconfiguration going on as well as suppression because of trade-offs. So there's a combination going on and that's, you're seeing that combination right here in this complex relationship between predator stress and the different immune components. And we've gone through most of these. I'm only gonna talk about one because of time, but we could go through these others and I could explain what we found and why it sort of fits the picture that we're having a reconfiguration of the immune response. And that's why it's not all just down-regulated, but we have this mix of responses. Animals, I think, make the best of non-optimal situations because they often find themselves in non-optimal situations. Either it's a heat wave, there's not enough food, there are predators, there are pathogens. Animals have to, to work together. All of their organ systems have to work together to try to come up with the best possible functioning for the context. So stress-induced immunosuppression allows a shifting of resources 
towards fight or flight. And that's molecular resources, not just energy, but you reconfigure the rest of the body so that they can work as best they can, even though they're missing some components. So they've lost some wheels, but they can still run a bit. And I think if you think all of these things are pathology, it masks the idea that these animals are working hard to survive under non-optimal situations. It's true, they're not as resistant as they used to be, but I wouldn't call that a pathology. I would call that making the best of a bad situation. So let's just for fun, let's run it the other way. What if you get sick? Here's my caterpillar, it got sick, it got a fungal infection or a bacterial infection. It's not like the predators are gonna say, oh, the poor thing's sick, let's not attack it now, we'll wait till it's better. That does not happen. The predators are going to come at this caterpillar, whether it's fighting an infection or not. So even when it's fighting an infection, it has to be prepared for predators. So let's see what happens when the immune response is activated first, and then a predator comes along. So we've just talked about the other way, where we've had the predator come along and how that impacts the immune response. So now let's see how the immune response impacts predator response, anti-predator response. So why would we think there'd be any interaction at all? Well, remember we said the immune response talks to the nervous system, and that is certainly true. So one of the, the ways that happens is when you become sick, when your immune responses are activated, there's a suite of behavioral changes called sickness behavior, and I think you've all experienced them. So you get lethargy, you lose your appetite, you get less active, and this occurs for animals across the phylogenetic tree. So it happens in mammals, in reptiles, in insects, in mollusks. So this is a very old, old response to sickness. And it is induced by cytokines and how they interact with the brain. And it turns out, we've shown this in caterpillars and insects, people have shown it in mammals, that the reduced feeding does enhance survival to many infections, not all, but at least some infections. So you won't be surprised probably when I tell you that immune challenge reduces anti-predator behavior in a wide range of, of animals. Given it tends to cause lethargy and everything else, it's not really a surprise perhaps that they're not quite, they're not quite as good at getting rid of predators when you're fighting an infection. Um, now, when we did these study, I just want to explain that unlike the live challenges I talked about previously, when we want to give our insects an immune challenge just to turn on the immune response, we give them a heat killed pathogen. So um, we give them heat killed gram negative, gram positive and fungal cells. We use heat kill challenge here because whenever you give a live challenge, you're really looking at a, a, a complex dance between the pathogen and the host because we know that pathogens have evolved to subvert the immune system. So they also are going to affect the immune system. So we just give a dead challenge. It activates the immune response, but it doesn't interfere with it. So that's why we do it. And this is just showing, this is just some uh, QPCR we did, showing that in the fat body, that immune organ, that our heat killed pathogens increase antimicrobial peptide production and the production of other immune molecules. All right, so let's go back to caterpillars. They do have anti-predator behavior and they are effective. So anti-predator behavior, basically the caterpillar does what's called a defensive strike. It takes, the, the caterpillar takes its head and it uses its head like a battering ram and it swings it around and it, it wallops anything that's trying to attack it. And it can also use its mandibles, its teeth, to, to bite at anything that's, at, that's trying to attack it. So that's what it does. And it, it sounds crude, but it's actually quite effective. So it can reduce parasitism and reduce predation. And this has been shown in field work. So we know that it, it actually does work. There's a reason for them to do it. Now for this behavior to work, 
you um, need your body wall muscles. They're absolutely critical. So for the animal to do this, to use its head like a battering ram, it's gonna need these body wall muscles and they're gonna to have to make a huge contraction and it's gotta be fast. So those body muscles are critical. Now, one of the other things that happens, just keep that in your mind, one of the other things that happens with the immune response, and this is why you need to know the physiological details to understand these interactions, is that beautiful work by Bagyar showed that hemocytes, insect hemocytes, this was done on Drosophila, absolutely need glucose. They need a ton of glucose. They become glucose hogs. They need glucose to be able to become more mobile, to do phagocytosis. And if they don't get enough glucose, they decline in their ability to defend you. So they're set, the cell mediated immunity, cell mediated immunity falters. They absolutely have to have it. And we know that the brain is sensitive to some of these immune signaling molecules. This has been shown in Drosophila, but I just thought I'd show some work from the caterpillars. So the caterpillar brain is listening for those immune signals. So insects do that too. So where is this glucose gonna come from for the, for the hemocytes? Where are they gonna get it from? Well, there's two places they can get it from. The fat body, of course, because that's the energy storage um, compound or organ. But it turns out it can only liberate so much so fast. So the cells, the hemocytes are looking for another source. And that source is muscle. You might be wondering, how does muscle participate in the immune system? This is it. So Yang and Haltmark did this work in Drosophila, and we've recently done it ourselves in Manduka, and it is true. Muscle donates some of its uh, glucose resources to the hemocytes. So muscle is one of the only other tissues that has a lot of glucose or a lot of glycogen, stored glucose as glycogen, readily available. And so it usually uses, the reason muscle has glycogen is it usually needs the glucose itself so that it can make big muscle contractions and it can work really hard and it has its own energy supply. But it's the only other tissue in the body that has a lot of it. So not surprisingly, when the immune system needs it, it calls on the two tissues that have it, which is the fat body and muscle. And they both answer the call. And here I just show you a loss of muscle glycogen during infection. So we give an immune challenge. So it's not a live infection. We give an immune challenge. It's sunset here. Sorry, I had to turn on the light. The, the, it's sun, it, 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 um, when we give an immune challenge, which is not a live challenge, we've just turned on the immune system. We see a decline in the amount of glycogen in the muscle. So indeed, caterpillar muscle like Drosophila muscle is participating in the immune system and it's donating some of its resources. Does that make a difference to how well that muscle works? Well, I don't know, the piece of the puzzle still missing for us is I don't may have a direct connection between the loss of glycogen and the decline in muscle function. But what I can tell you is we measured the force that the, um, the head has when it does its defensive strike we had an accelerometer, so we just built this little apparatus to measure the force that the caterpillar head was striking with. And it turns out the caterpillar head could strike with less force during an immune challenge. So when the animal responding to the, the heat kill challenges, it, was, it had a weaker defensive strike. So it was weaker. So it looks like what's happening is the muscle is donating its resources and because it's got less resources or in addition, there might be other things going on, we see a decline in muscle function. And it turns out this is biologically significant. So what we did was we tested caterpillars during an immune challenge, we put them in with parasitic wasps and we just asked, how good are they at defending themselves against parasitic wasps? And we found that control animals or sham injected animals were able to prevent parasitism 50% of the time, about 50% of the time when they were attacked by parasitic wasps. 
that fell down to about a third when they had an immune challenge. So their muscles are donating glycogen, are donating glucose, they are less effective, the defensive strike is weaker, and that makes them more susceptible to things like parasitic wasps and presumably other predators. So it's biologically significant. So this is, so this is another example where you're seeing system-wide donation of resources to get things to work the way they need to. So muscle is giving up resources. But does that mean the animal doesn't do anything to try to fix its loss of anti-predator behavior? It's, it's a significant problem. So does it do anything to help? Does it do any reconfiguration here? Do we see evidence of that? And the answer is yes. There is an increase in peripheral sensitivity during immune challenge. So in other words, if you look at the force you need to poke the animal, this is using these von Frey hairs where you can give a known force to the body wall, you can get them to give you a defensive strike. After an immune challenge, they will do a defensive strike to very little force. In other words, they become more sensitive. They become twitchier and they're faster to respond. So they have less force, but they're faster. And it turns out that increase in peripheral sensitivity, which is probably due to an increase in their sensory neuron sensitivity, is can, you can induce it simply by injecting a cytokine. So an immune signaling molecule, which is PSP, plasmatocyte spreading peptide, which is an important cytokine in Manduka, my, my caterpillar, you can inject that and get the same effect as you would if you injected heat killed pathogen to activate the immune system. So it looks like the immune system is calling on sensory neurons to be more sensitive. And we don't know the direction of this. So let's sort of re, re sort of go from the beginning. So when we have a pathogen come in, there's the release of cytokines, which go to the central nervous system. And I showed you there were receptors for those things in the brain of the caterpillar. And we don't know if it's a direct central nervous system connection or whether cytokines directly affect the sensory neurons or whether it's a combination of the two. But one of the things that happens during an immune response is that these sensory neurons become more sensitive and so that the defensive strike occurs sooner and faster, even though it's weaker. I would argue that's part of this reconfiguration where different systems are rewiring themselves and changing their sensitivities and changing the way they work so they can optimize function given the, given the context. Remember, selection is not for perfection. It's to try to make the best of a bad business sometimes. So when an animal is faced with suboptimal conditions, it's going to rewire itself in the best way it can to give a maximal response given, given the challenges that it faces. And it can do this because organisms are interconnected networks. I think that's one of the selective advantages of having these complex inter-organ connections interphysiological system connections. Why are they part of these big networks? They're part of these big networks so that they can share resources, they can rejig themselves, they can listen to each other's signaling molecules because they have to, at the organismal level, the animal has to make a coordinated response. So even though we sometimes see a reduction in function during these multiple stressors, I would argue that much of the time it's not pathology. I mean, sometimes it might be, but sometimes it's the adaptive response to difficult situation. So I hope I've convinced you that animals can have these complex interactions and that allows them, it gives them certain strengths and we should think about them as team players. All of these physiological systems that you work on are part of a team. And sometimes when you see things that, that don't make sense, maybe because you're not thinking of the other team players that it has to work with. So I want to thank 
Um, I have two of my uh, graduate students who did a lot of work on this project, Laura McMillan and Dylan Miller. And of course, everybody knows that you can't do science by yourself. And so I had a team of incredibly talented and, and, and uh, hardworking undergraduate students who also helped me do this. And of course, um, my Canadian funding agency that funded the work. So thank you so much for listening. And I am happy to take any questions you may have. I think I can see them in the chat. Thank you so much, Dr. Adam, for this lecture. It was amazing, very amazing. There are some questions in the chat. I will read the first, okay? Okay, sure. I'm sorry this took, I timed myself and I seem to have taken longer than I thought. I'm so sorry, I'll be fast with the questions. <laughs> no problem. Let for, let's go for the first one. The first one was from Fernando Gomes. In vertebrates, many immune fun functions are enhanced by acute stressors and suppressed by chronic stressors. Do you see an analogous response in insects? Yes, yeah, so the difference between acute and chronic is very important in mammalian systems. To be quite honest, you do see it in insects, but it's a lot more subtle. So in, in vertebrates, there's a completely different type of response sometimes between acute and chronic. In the insects, when we're having predator stress, for example, and the effects on say gene expression in the fat body for antimicrobial peptides, it's, it's sort of a more of a, more of a gradation. It's sort of a quality, it's a quantitative change as opposed to a qualitative change. The pattern doesn't really change so much unless you really push them. And then you can get a slightly different pattern, but it's, um, uh, I find it's less of a, a distinct, a clear distinction as what I've read in the mammalian literature. So, um, I mean, I don't work on mammals myself, but in, in insects, it's uh, usually maybe just an, a deepening of the effect as opposed to a completely different kind of response. I understand. I, I have had a, a question very similar, but my question, my personal question uh, came out of the blue in the middle of the lecture. It's about bees. Did you know if bees there, uh, that, yeah, that pass with uh, stressors like a predator could be a similar response to Monduka? So, so bees, oh, poor bees, what a tough time they're having. Um, yeah, so, so that's a great example. Bees are a great example of an organism having to fight multiple stressors simultaneously. So, so that's been a real issue. And um, I'm, not an, I'm not an expert on colony collapse disorder, but it would appear that having to fight so many things at once, introduce pathogens, pesticides, um, uh, dealing with monocultural, monoculture agriculture has just been a little too much for the bees. And they're, and they're really, they're trying to spread their resources over so many different challenges. They're really having trouble making a go of it. Many of the insects have, most of their stress responses are very similar. So bees also have octopamine and as a neuromodulator and as a neurohormone. So um, I'm not quite sure if I'm answering your question, but, but most insects, including bees, have very similar stress response systems and immune systems, except bees have reduced immune systems, interestingly enough. They have fewer antimicrobial peptides and people have thought it's because they're social insects and they have a lot of social immunity. They've, they've over time lost some of their um, uh, uh, immune uh, antimicrobial peptides. Yeah, I just realized that in your lecture because now the diseases in bees are more stronger than the past. Yeah. Very it's, more. It, yeah, it's, a, it's very sad actually. It's, it's yeah. an example of, um, the limits of adaptation, right? And that's the problem with climate change. It's happening so fast that animals have, they, like insects have these robust adaptive responses, but you can see each of them come with a cost. They're not cost-free. And at some point the animals are going to have, have paid so many costs so they can spread themselves out to so many challenges. It doesn't take much to knock them off their perch, basically to kill them. Yeah. Let's go for the second question. Yeah. It was from Mayara Makari. 
So the chemical part of the immune system is impacted by the moleculars and use it, are used in a pathway. In this case, stress by predator. Uh, so I'm. I, I think there's a typo in this. I'm just trying to trying to imagine. So the so the the I mean the chem the the humoral part of the immune system is impacted by the. Sorry, I, I'm afraid I don't understand the question. Do you? Can you? Can you? Can we ask? In my opinion, I I. I imagine that he, she wanted to say that if the chemicals like octopamine oh, could, yes. okay. could impact in, in this way, in the pathway of the stress by predator, like, like you said in the lecture, if the, the octopamine and the another chemical compounds could impact at the same way. So, so yes, so I left out a whole half of the story because I ran out of time. Octopamine is actually also used by the immune system. The immune system induces a stress response, but it's a lower stress response, but it releases some octopamine to help liberate energy compounds for itself. And the interesting thing about that is you would say, well, wait a second, doesn't that cause immunosuppression? But it turns out when octopamine is released, when pathogens are present, the combination of cytokine receptor activation and octopamine receptor activation causes a different intracellular response. So that's how cells can be context dependent. So we didn't talk about the intracellular part. So I hope I'm answering that question, but yes, the immune system uses some of the same molecules to um, do some of the same things like activate energy can, uh, to get energy liberation for its own, to fuel its own response. Okay, I think that was a good answer for this, this question. Let's go for the, the third question. This shift of this molecule can be aggravated by the time of continuous stress. We know that continuous stress can affect neurological, vascular, and other system in vertebrate. This over response or a state of constant vigilance in insects affect other systems as well? So it's interesting. <laughs> People have not done a lot of work on this, but um, my, my um, colleague, Jennifer Taylor at Cornell University did a wonderful study where she looked at the long-term effects of predator stress with Manduka, looking at their development. And one of the things that got changed was their digestive system became more efficient, which was odd. Um, so it's kind of a positive effect. Um, I know what you're thinking is that eventually, eventually, you're going to start to see systems run down as these comp as these compens compensatory mechanisms just run to the end of their road. They can't they can't compensate anymore. We don't see that so much. I wonder if it's because insects are short lived. They, you know, they, they can't. A long-lived stress for an insect is a few days, and um, you know that's just maybe that doesn't translate well in terms of you think about long stress in even rodents. You're talking about you know a week or two um, or several days, so uh, maybe there's a difference that way. So when people have looked at long-term stressors in insects, again, haven't seen the same kind of switch to suddenly they die. Um, now I should say. In Drosophila mutants, if you knock out certain pathways, you can do it. So when you knock out certain pathways in, um, in Drosophila, for example, an immune challenge can cause a wasting disease and end up causing Drosophila to die because they run out of fat reserves, because they liberate all of their fat reserves. They wouldn't usually do that even if they had a chronic infection. They do it because they have this mutation. So you can push insects to do it, but they don't typically, um, I don't typically see that with predator stress or even with immune challenge. Usually they just lose and the pathogen takes over as opposed to causing a lot of other damage that leads to death. But I say that, and again, it has not, as you can imagine, people aren't as concerned about long-term chronic stress effects on insects as they are on mammals. So it's sort of an understudied area. So I don't want to make you think I, we know more than we do. Like in bees, the, the species that I, I work, just the worker just live 
almost 40 days, 45 days. So it's a long term, it's a long term uh, evaluation, just 45 days. Let's go yeah, for I that. I think having a short lifespan really does sort of change the dynamics and the selection pressures on you. So I, I think that's why maybe uh, you don't see quite the same kind of chronic stress effects. Yeah, I agree. Let's go for the first question. It's from Camila Olarte. During our response against pathogens, did you observe any changes in any changes in body temperature during feces immune responses? So that's a great question. In insects, they don't have, um, they don't maintain a constant body temperature. So when they get sick, there's no increase in body temperature, except some of them show behavioral fever. So some insects like grasshoppers, when they get sick, they bask in the sun to raise their body temperature. And that helps them get rid of pathogens. So not all insects do it. It's not like in, in mammals where pretty much all mammals have a fever response. Uh, birds interestingly have a complex response. So they, they show, some birds show a decrease in body temperature when they get infected, not an increase. So it depends a little bit on the animal you're talking about. In terms of the insects, so in terms of my caterpillars, there's no evidence that they do behavioral thermoregulation. I, I don't see any evidence of behavioral fever in them. So they don't have the ability to raise their body temperature. But that, that is actually, a, I've thought about that in terms of reptiles and amphibians, because then you're also thinking about changing your whole metabolic rate. And, and that's a huge, huge stressor and a huge cost. But, but most insects don't, don't go that way. Okay. Let's go for another one from Camila too. Is temperature, climate change, changing this improved function of the immune system? Well, it's, um, it's complicated actually, and uh, it depends. Now you guys, live, you guys live in the tropics and most of your insects are not gonna be happy with climate change because some of them are going to bump into the, their thermal tolerance. So insects are pretty, are, are pretty resilient because they have to, because they don't keep a constant body temperature. Like we keep a bo constant body temperature. Like we're, we're, we're the, the Ferraris of the animal kingdom. We, we um, are very expensive metabolically, but it means our enzymes are optimized for particular temperature. Insects have much more permissive enzymes because they have to deal with quite a spread in temperature, but they do hit a maximum. And the concern has been for tropical insects, they're going to bump into their maximum. Where I live in, in the north part of the temperate zone, most of the insects that live in Nova Scotia, this is the northern end of their range. So you bet I've done a study with some of them. Yes, their immune systems work better. Everything works better. They love climate change. <laughs> in Canada is going to be that our insect pests are going to become super pests because they're going to love the hot, hotter weather as a rule. I say that except that we just had these incredible heat waves in BC. You guys, British Columbia is on the West Coast. And typically it's the, it's the temperate rainforest and it usually never gets above 30 degrees. There was one part of BC that had temperatures of 49 degrees. That is just unheard of in Canada. That, that was like a first that broke all the records. So when I say that in Canada, insects are gonna love climate change, nobody likes 49 degrees. So I think, um, I think we're in for some interesting times uh, in terms of temperature. If you're a thermal biologist, this is a great time to be studying temperature effects on, on animals. Yeah, like in another way, I, I will talk about this again because it's my, like you, you are loves uh, Munduka and I, I love stingless bees. Uh, Maybe oh. bee, they, they are suffering a lot with the climate change because here in Brazil, the temperature is just the same all the year mm -hmm. in my region. So I, I made a work if one degree variation of the temperature could impact the reproduction of the stingless bees and it could impact a lot. Uh, some, some queens could stop totally the, 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 laying, the laying production. So 
So what that yeah. suggests is they've evolved for this narrow temperature window and they've been selected to optimize their enzymes for those that temperature. And it sounds like if they go beyond it, they actually don't have a big temperature resilience. That's yeah. interesting. I didn't know that about some insects. Let's go for the, the seventh question from Giovanni. Amazing talk. Given the co reconfiguration of immune system in stressful situations in insects, do you think an additional stressor stimulus can, in certain cases, act as a booster from vaccine responses? Oh, this is a study by one of my favorite guys, um, Theodore uh, Dauber, who's at Stanford. So he did some work some time ago because he, he, you know, he some of his work actually inspired me to do the work I did on the caterpillars. He, for a long time, didn't believe. Well, he thought that um, people needed to look at the relationship between acute stress and immune responses a little more carefully. And he found that if you give people minor stressors you do get a better, a better response to vaccination. You get a better uh, antibody production response. I'm not, again, not an expert in mammalian systems, but um, that's what he found. And, and you know, this has been verified and replicated a number of times. So he didn't find the same with chronic stress, again, this difference. Um, but with acute stressors, he, he did, although I have to laugh because, you know, you don't really want to scare children and then give them a vaccination. You'll <laughs> never get back in the doctor's office if you do that. So, so I'm not sure it's practically, uh, practically would work for kids, but, um, but it's definitely true that there are interesting interactions between stress and immune systems in insects. They don't have acquired immunity. So vaccination doesn't quite work the same way. And it's, it's a really interesting story and I won't go into it because that was the intracellular part. But basically when animals or insects are stressed, they increase their um, baseline production of antimicrobial peptides. So it goes up. So that does mean that they have more, more sort of molecules on board, but they can't they can't increase it when they get an infection. They have trouble making those extra peptides and proteins. So they're still immunosuppressed, but they, they kind of, as long as they can get the invader with their increased baseline, they're okay. But if it gets away from them, they don't have much in the way of a, um, an ability to come back from that. I understood. It's like, there's no memory after the, the infection, like in us. Well, not really. It's they don't have specific memory, but like if your stingless bees get an infection, they'll upregulate their antimicrobial peptide and protein production, and they'll leave it high for a while. So if they get a second infection, they are more resistant, but not, but, but not for the specific pathogen. It, you know, could be any bacterium, but they pay for that. So your females and your, you know, will have less, be able to lay fewer eggs and, you know, might have shortened lifespan. So insects, te te if they, when they have an immune challenge, they, they make a lot of reactive molecules and they get oxidative stress and they usually take a hit in their lifespan. Y Jens Rolf wrote a, and, and his student Khan wrote a wonderful paper where they showed that really clearly, that uh, insects take a lifespan hit when they have a, an, a robust immune response. Let's go for the last question. I oh, it's an oxidative stress, all right. <laughs> From Daniel Moreira, Dr. Adamo, can you briefly comment on the role of endogenous antioxidants and oxidative, oxidativity stress in insect stress response? Oh, I have such an interest in this question. I haven't done a lot, but what I can tell you is um, one of the things I'm interested in right now and have been for a while is the molecule glutathione. Glutathione is an antioxidant and it's important for buffering against oxidative stress. And insects have a ton of it. And um, it's actually an enormous sink of cysteine, which is a rare amino acid for insects. So it's extremely expensive. And not surprisingly, when they have food stress or various other types of stressors, their glutathione levels go down. What that means in terms of immune function is I would have thought that they would have shifted to less, ex, less um, to immune responses that generate less oxidative stress under those situations, but I actually didn't see that. 
So um, I'm not sure if it's because they, um, they just, they have, they, they just take the oxidative stress. So the people who've done the most work on this has actually been Robbie Stocks looking at damselfly larvae. And what he found is they just, they seem to just take the hit. So they take that they have this oxidative stress and they don't upregulate antioxidant protection very much. So it's like, it may be again, because they're short lived. We're here for a good time, not a long time. So they'll take a certain hit as, and they'd rather put their resources into increased reproduction as opposed to somatic maintenance. So what we find is that immune challenged animals have a reduction, insects have a reduction in their lifespan. And many of us think it's probably oxidative stress that's killed, that is leading to this reduction and that they're not protecting themselves from it, even though they have some of the tools, they just don't want to spend the expense, I think. So that's, that's, and, and this is based on three species out of like 30 million. So, you know, I wouldn't, it's not, that's what we found so far in the field. If that helps answers the question. I see. I think there are no more questions in the chat, but I had one, another one personal Perfect. question. And in, in your opinion, the heat waves that are happening in all the world could change the way like Monduka make responses to predators and disease? So um, I guess it depends on the size of the heat waves. So I'm working on a question, not with Manduka sext, I have another project looking at what's called the oblique banded leaf roller, another caterpillar, which is a pest on apple trees. And so it, we're worried that um, they're gonna love climate change and they'll be harder to control. So in other words, their ability to detoxify pesticides and their ability to resist biological control means their immune system are actually gonna be enhanced with higher temperatures. So when they have these heat waves, they're actually gonna be harder to kill. I'm not sure that's entirely true. And it depends completely on the size, of course, on the, of the heat wave. And I would have thought, I would have said a few years ago that in Canada, you would never get heat waves that were more than about 35 degrees. But I'm not so sure that's true anymore. And I think once you start to get up to 40 degrees, um, Manduka starts to really struggle. And then you see a reduction in their ability this is work by Joel Kingsolver on Manduka. So he's been looking at heat waves further south in North Carolina, where Manduka are very common and um, finding that they're having real, they're really struggling and that there's, uh, it's, it's pluses and minuses though. That's what's so fun. So they do have trouble with their immune systems, but the parasitic wasp that hits them is even more temperature sensitive. So they struggle, but it kills the wasp larvae. So they all die. <laughs> So they kind of get a free pass. They, they're not as able to encapsulate the eggs and get rid of them, but the eggs die anyway at those high temperatures. So, you know, um, eh, winners and losers. So I think it's gonna be complicated to sort out and it is not going to be easy to, and particularly when you're talking about a wide range of species, I, I think it's gonna be hard. So I think Manduka sexta in Canada, where we have it in, in Southern Ontario is gonna love heat waves until they get to be about 40 degrees and then they're not gonna love them anymore. Sorry, Dr. Adamo, but actually there are another question to you from Guilherme. Okay. Thank you, thank you for the amazing talk. Do you think that caloric rest restriction would not be the dentrometrol? to immunity of field crickets due to the illness-induced anorexia and physiological trade-offs? So, yeah, so for crickets, so crickets are very different animals. You always have to, and I know you guys must do this because, you know, you're so surrounded by complex, uh, beautiful, you know, plants and animals. And uh, I always think of Brazil as an incredibly ecologically rich place, even though I've never been there. So I'm just imagining, but, um, in terms of crickets, you have to think about the natural history of your animal. Manduka sexta eats one food. It lives on one plant. It's pretty simple, which is why I like it. Crickets are a lot more complicated and they have a wide range of, of foods that they'll eat. Um, and what we know with illness-induced anorexia, one of the things it seems to do is it does two things. It helps prevent competition 
for molecular resources between digestion and immune defense. One of those, and one of those molecules is apolipoforin-3. So if crickets are given a high fat diet, they actually do not do very well if they get sick. So a high fat diet, and it's probably, it looks like it's because of course, again, apolipoforin-3 gets shunted away to take the fat from the gut and put it into storage. And so it, it gets lost as an immune surveillance molecule. The other problem is that it has to do with, with the gut itself and the fact that in those gut cells, there's supposed to be immune responses as well as digestive responses. And some of those don't interact well. So my student, Laura McMillan and I published a paper on that in Manduka, but I think with crickets, it would be much the same. So I do, there is evidence that illness induced anorexia is helpful. And I think one of the reasons it's helpful is it prevents some of these um, competitions for resources, molecular resources. Okay. I'm, I want to, to thank you very much for this amazing talk, Dr. Adam. It was really amazing. Oh, thank you so much. I, I really, I'm so sorry I'm not there. This would be, I would just, I would love to see Brazil someday. I bet it's just like a naturalist you, paradise. Actually, you are not here yet. I <laughs> think in the future you, you could, uh, came here to, to visit us. I would love to, I would love to. I just, I'm thinking like, like right now, it's, it's just the start of winter for us and everything has gone to sleep. You know, if I went looking for a bug, I wouldn't be able to find one. It's, mm -hmm. um, it, everything kind of goes into a, uh, just like a hibernation and we can't, it, you know, it's, it's a little different. Everything looks kind of dead and gone. So, yeah. I would also to thank the audience for all the attention and questions today. I hope you have enjoyed this talk. Yes, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for coming. We plan in the future, in the future to continue organizing physio webinars on years to come. So stay tuned for future events on this channel. In case you missed presentations from 2020 and 2021, please check our playlist on YouTube. All webinars are available on the channel. Links in description. Thank you all for the interest. See you in the next year. <laughs>